which I talk about all the time, and Susan has an entire website devoted to it. Now, a lot of people are very skeptical of Wikipedia. Uh, there's a lot of articles that have been written about this, uh, this is wrong or this is wrong, and how can it possibly be right when you're just getting volunteers from all over the Internet writing stuff? There's going to be mistakes in it. And yes, there are mistakes in Wikipedia all the time. And crazy stuff gets put in Wikipedia all the time. And I say that that's not a reason to ignore Wikipedia. That's all the more reason that skeptics need to get involved. We need to be out there fixing this stuff. Uh, and a lot of the stuff really isn't as bad as you would think it is. Um, it really does quite well. But here's the big argument. I did some uh, measurements of traffic on Wikipedia, and I picked the two best sites, the two best pages that I have on my What's the Harm website in terms of how highly they rank in Google. So like if you Google uh, ozone therapy, which is this weird alt-med thing, um, I'm one of the first links that you find in Google, which is what you want. You want to be on that first page of results. Well, Wikipedia is almost always on the first page of results for various technical reasons about how Google does what it does. And both um, Wikipedia publishes its traffic statistics, so I actually ran the charts for, that's an entire year of traffic at Wikipedia for attachment therapy and ozone therapy, which are two pages that are titled the same. I have a page about each of those things. Wikipedia has a page about each of those things. We both show up in the Google results right next to each other. And as you can see, Wikipedia has somewhere between five and 50 times the traffic I get. So whether I like it or not, five to 50 times as many people are reading about these things on Wikipedia than are reading my page about it. So I think we owe it to those people to go out there and try to make those articles as skeptical as possible. But the interesting thing is, is that because Wikipedia is so trusted and because they license their content out, all the content on Wikipedia is licensed out. It can be used in books, it can be used in other websites and things like that. It shows up in other places. And here's an example. Google just recently uh, introduced a new thing called Knowledge Graph. You may have noticed it when you do a Google search now, you sometimes get these little boxes to the right-hand side that have kind of a summary of what you're looking for. And here's what you see if you search John Edward. Um, and it's got a little summary, it's got a picture of him, and it's got a little summary that came from the top of his Wikipedia article, and a few key facts like when he was born and stuff based on what people are searching for. But it also has this list of people that are related to him, and you'll notice that right there on the bottom <laughs> is James Randi staring out at you. Uh, in many of these searches, James Randi wouldn't have shown up before. But now, people are looking for John Edward, and they're going to say, hey, who's this dude? And they're going to click on that name, and they're going to find out about James Randi's work. Uh, that's a powerful thing, and in part, that happens because the folks editing Wikipedia, the folks that Susan helps out on her blog, um, have created these links. You know, when if James Randi is quoted in an article about John Edward, that'll get put in Wikipedia, and Google picks that up and generates these links. So that's a, an excellent form of outreach. It's kind of a deep area. Again, it's not a one-click thing. Uh, there are some one-click things. Fixing vandalism on Wikipedia can be one-click once you learn how to do it. Um, but I've got a bunch of help on uh, Skept Tools, and Susan's blog is called Gorilla Skepticism on Wikipedia. You can just Google that, and you'll find it. She's got all this interesting stuff about projects that they're working on, like translating articles. Now, one of the things I would warn people about is not all online things that you can get involved in when it with are created equal. There's kind of this class of thing that a lot of people call slacktivism. Now, that was originally intended as a positive term of, look how we can achieve things very easily with a mouse click. But it's sort of become a pejorative term in that there's a lot of folks who just engage in these kind of click, oh, I'll click this, I'll click that. Um, and they don't really achieve that much. And it's stuff like forwarding emails, retweeting stuff on Twitter, clicking like, you know, oh, like our page on Facebook. None of these things are inherently bad, and they do help. Like if somebody's trying to promote something, liking their page on, on Facebook does help them for technical reasons about how Facebook uh, publishes stuff. But some of them really don't achieve that much. And I, 
uh, very kind of somewhat famously came out in, in my talk in uh, Las Vegas against the idea of bombing online polls. Um, some people call it freeping because of the site called Free Republic. But where people will find a poll that's going, uh, you know, it's just one of these silly, uh, unscientific polls on a newspaper site, and they will go and send all their readers over there to send it in a different direction. You know, maybe it's Barack Obama versus Mitt Romney, or creationism versus evolution, or whatever it is, and whatever your belief is, you send all your readers over there to send the poll in the other direction. And it's a giant waste of time. Uh, because no one, including those sites that post those polls, really care, okay? The only reason newspaper sites put those polls up is because it helps keep you on the site, right? You'll, you'll vote in the poll, you'll come back the next day and see what the result is. Six months later, the poll is gone. They don't keep the results, they don't care. And you can find interview after interview of people in the newspaper industry where they don't look at the results of those polls. What they do look at is what topics people are interested in. So if, if somebody puts a poll about something dumb and you go and bomb that poll, you're sending them exactly the wrong message. You're telling them, yeah, I like more content about this dumb thing. <laughs> so I, I don't think that bombing polls is a good thing to get involved with. Now, you could argue that Web of Trust is a giant poll that we're bombing. Uh, I would argue it's a little bit more scientific and a little bit more involved in that, but at least it has an effect, okay? That's what I, I, I ask people to think about, is will you achieve a ta tangible goal? And with Web of Trust, there is a tangible goal. You're trying to get that warning screen to pop up on 30 million screens when people go to those alt-med websites. Um, you're trying to create content that will be visible for more than a week, right? If you vote in a poll, that's going to go away pretty quickly. Uh, but if you put some content on Wikipedia, there's content I put on Wikipedia four or more years ago, and it's still there, and people are still reading it every day. Um, that's a tangible effect that actually goes into the future and actually achieves something. There's another really interesting thing that's been going on in skepticism that, uh, again, can, you can get involved with, and um, it's the use of skeptical tools. These are kind of a little bit different than websites. Often they're pieces of software or apps you put on your phone. One of them is something called fish barrel, um, as in shooting a fish in a barrel. And what it is is another one of these browser plugins like Web of Trust. You have to use the Chrome browser that Google gives away. But you plug it in, and it, it's sort of a helper. It's like an assistant skeptic. And the idea is if you, it partic works particularly well in the UK and other countries that have regulatory agencies that actually care and want to give, um, want to get, get the public to report things. It doesn't work as well in the US, uh, although you can uh, give FDA complaints with this. But the idea is you can complain to the regulatory agencies about, in particular, alt med people, but also anyone, like for instance in the UK, they have an advertising truth and advertising agency called the ASA, and you can file a complaint and say this person, this website is making a claim that's untrue. Another thing that you can use to help you as a skeptic is there's iPhone apps. I mentioned the skeptic history iPhone app, but there's three iPhone apps. Uh, there's probably more, but I've got these three. This one in the upper left is called Creationist Claims, and they're databases of interesting skeptical information boiled down into sound bites and things. That the, This one is about creationism. The one in the middle is all about climate change. And the bottom right is Skeptic's Dictionary, which has more general topics. But the idea is that if you're out in the bar and somebody says, hey, these rubber power bands that I use really help my balance, and you don't remember what the details is on that, you can pull out, for instance, the Skeptic's Dictionary, and maybe there's an article on power bands. Or if somebody is saying something about how climate change, they disagree with climate change, or they heard about a study, you can go pull out this climate change app and find out, you know, maybe they're wrong about it, and tell them what's right. Another one that came out, and actually the author of it was at TAM in Vegas, is a tool called Rebutter. Um, and the idea here isn't so much debunking, but facilitating people finding the debunking. This is a good one-click, well, two-clicks thing, where if you find a good piece of web content 
that rebuts, as in rebuttal, uh, or debunks some other piece of web content. Again, it's a browser plugin. You get a little icon in the corner, and you can, in a few clicks, say, okay, this article is a good opposite to this article. And then the idea is that when someone has this loaded, if they're reading the bad article, they'll get a little beep, and an a icon will light up and say, hey, after you're done reading that, again, we're not interested in censoring anything, we're not interested in stopping people from reading anything, but let's go read the other side of the story. Let's go read what science has to say about this. And there's a whole bunch of other tools that are kind of in the works right now. Um, uh, and these are some of the names. Hypothesis is a big one. And a lot of these are being built by people in the newspaper industry, and they're all focused around the idea of fact-checking and um, uh, stopping these viral things go, that are going on out on the Internet. And several of these are going to be crowdsourced sort of things like Rebutter, like Wikipedia, like Web of Trust, that need people out in the public to go and do these things. So I encourage you to keep an eye out for these things and, and uh, install these browser plugins and, and learn how to use them. And you can help basically, you know, Rebutter, if they wanted to build a database of every article on the internet that rebutted every other article, they'd have to hire a giant staff. But by enlisting the general public to make a few mouse clicks, they can build that database and help people find this good content, um, and they can concentrate on making the software better.